Hi, I'm Joel Oppenheimer, and we are on the second floor of our downtown Chicago art gallery. Today, we're going to explore six more prints from our natural history art collection. We're going to be viewing two engravings by Pierre-Joseph Redoute, two lithographs by John James Audubon from the Octavo edition, and two hand-colored lithographs by Edward Lear. We're going to begin today by viewing two stipple engravings by the French artist Pierre-Joseph Redoute. Redoute was actually Belgian by birth, but as a very young man, he made his way to Paris and there his precocious talents were quickly recognized by important botanical artists. It wasn't long before he had uh, enjoyed the patronage of Marie Antoinette and became the official painter of flowers for her cabinet. Pierre Redoute transitioned through the French Revolution and a story that goes that while the royal family was imprisoned in the beginning of the revolution, Redite was summoned to the prison because there was a cactus in bloom that they wanted him to capture. Now, Marie Antoinette and Josephine Bonaparte shared something in common, and that was their love of horticulture and beautiful flowers. And as a result, Redite became the favorite artist of Josephine Bonaparte after the revolution. And it was there in the gardens of Malmaison that he had access to many of the flowers that he painted. We're going to look at two stipple engravings from his first series called Les Liliacées that was published between 1802 and 1817. These are stipple engravings printed a la poupée Redite is credited not with the invention of stipple engraving, but actually perfecting the technique and, it, and applying it to his flower prints. The stipple engraving varies from line engraving in that it's a pointless technique. And the, there's a tool that is sort of a pyra reversed pyramid shaped uh, metal tool that's used to, to create little depressions and points into the copper plate. So these points vary in size depending on how much depth there is achieved in penetrating the copper and also they vary in terms of how close together they are placed. And in, in masterfully applying that technique, tremendous subtlety is achieved in the engraving technique. That combined with the alapu pay coloring is what resulted in these marvelous engravings that very, very closely resembled the original paintings, watercolor paintings by Redoute. The alapu pay coloring technique was achieved before printed color had been invented. So the way that it was applied to the plate was that the copper plate was colored in full color and then the impression was made onto the paper. So in essence, each engraving is unique. Now, Another aspect of the a la poupée and uh, coloring and stipple engraving combination is that previously in hand colored engravings, it was a layering process where the engraving, which supplied all of the tonality and drawing form was done in one color, a black ink usually. And then in the studio, after the print was made, colorists would apply transparent watercolor over the black engraving. With a la poupée, 
because the color is incorporated into the printing process, there's a, a uniform tra transition from color and tone that is absolutely seam seamless and again replicates the original painting in, in remarkable fashion. Here we have the tiger lily. This is one of the grand images on large folio paper. And if we show a close-up of the engraving, you will be able to see the quality that is achieved and the lifelike quality. Now, Redite is really known as the most prominent, important artist of flowers, certainly of the 19th century. His ability to capture the flowers was paralleled somewhat in, uh, in Audubon's ability to capture birds. So each artist has their own forte. In this particular case, their genius and their ability in a particular subject matter to portray it. When one views a Redite engraving, here is the soldier lily from the same series, Le Liliaceae. You are viewing not just a picture of a flower, but an exact portrait of that specific flower that Redite was looking at that day. And he captures the personality, if you will, of the flower, just as Audubon captured the personality of his living subjects. Now, we're going to examine two prints from Audubon's second octavo edition. When Audubon finished the large double elephant folio Birds of America in 1839, he was world famous and he had generated a lot of income during that period of time and his, the family, the Audubon family, were living quite well. But he was not so wealthy that he could retire. So he began the next project, and that was a miniature edition called the Octavo edition. Octavo meaning a one-eighth sized sheet. Interestingly, the Audubon family continually published works in subsequent editions, including the quadrupeds and a second octavo edition, all the way up to and past John James Audubon's death. Publishing and making hand-colored natural history works became a family industry, and his sons continued that tradition uh, with uh, the second octavo edition. Now, we're going to view the Roseate Spoonbill. This is the second edition again. It's a hand-colored lithograph. And it is a one-eighth size sheet. However, it is not one-eighth the size of the double elephant folio sheet. It's actually called the Royal Octavo Edition. And the term royal refer as a name of a paper size. This is a one-eighth size sheet from a royal piece of paper. We're going to show you now what distinguishes the second octavo edition from the first edition. With the second edition, it's virtually the same in almost every aspect. It's a hand-colored lithograph. The lithograph is drawn on stone. In this case, the octavo edition was largely printed and uh, lithographed by a well-known Philadelphian lithographer by the name of J.T. Bowen. And you will see his name here on the bottom right-hand corner of the print. However, the second edition was published in 1856. The first edition was published 1839 through 1844. 
By 1856, they were beginning to experiment with printed color, and one color was introduced to these prints in the form of what's called a tint stone. So the lithograph, the primary image, was printed in black ink, but there was a, a color, this, in this case a greenish blue color that you can see mostly in the sky, that was also printed from a separate stone, and that was the tenth stone. The remainder of the image was all hand colored. So all of the reds and the greens and the blues that you see are hand colored exactly as they would have been in the first edition. Here we have a complete first edition in bound form. The octavo prints were sold as were Audubon's first large double elephant folio by subscription, and it took four years to complete a subscription. And those prints were issued in parts, or five at a time, in loosely bound paper fascicles. Over the four-year period, the subscribers would have acquired the entire collection, and many of them chose to have those sets bound. The first and second edition, when found complete, were both bound in seven volumes. In all, there were seven different Audubon Octavo editions published all the way up until 1871. However, only the first two editions were created under the auspices of the Audubon family. The first edition published by John James Audubon, the second edition published by his son, John Woodhouse Audubon, and Victor Gifford Audubon. So those are the only two editions that were actually made by the Audubons. And the later octavo editions, although they still have some hand coloring and largely use the same imagery, they, the stones were redrawn and the pictures are really, in some respects, completely different from the first and second octavo editions. Now, in this volume, we have the first edition of the Roseate Spoonbill. And if I can, make, perhaps if I hold this up here, I can show you the two prints side by side. The first edition in the volume does not have the tint stone. There is a sky that's painted in, but that's all a watercolor wash, whereas the sky in the second edition image is printed from the tint stone. Also distinguishing the two editions typically are different type styles that are used on the bottom inscriptions that have Audubon's name and Bowen's, the printmaker's name. However, this is not a definitive way in which to tell the difference between first and second edition prints because there are rare exceptions where first editions have the same type style at the bottom, the larger block lettering, as the, and, and the first edition typically has a very small, delicate, italicized lettering at the bottom. It's most likely that the first edition prints with the block lettering were produced very late in the edition as they were transitioning into what later would become the second edition prints. Now, we'll take a look at the Louisiana heron. Now, today this is known as the tricolor heron. Many of the names of Audubon's birds have changed uh, over the years. Another interesting aspect is that when the octavo edition was issued, the plates were put into correct phylogenic order so that the birds and the species follow a logical pattern in, in, in terms of genus and species. In the, in the original double elephant folio, Audubon produced the plates essentially as he was completing the paintings and he didn't have the opportunity to put them into a logical scientific order. So this became the goal of the octavo edition 
And the plate numbers in the octavo edition are also the same as the plate numbers in the BN, the later double elephant folio edition that was published by Audubon's son, John Woodhouse Audubon. The first edition of Audubon's octavo, of course, is the most desirable as a collectible. And aesthetically, it has some advantages over the second edition. However, the second edition prints are beautifully rendered hand-colored lithographs published by the Audubon family. And they are about half the price of the first edition prints. So they represent a very good value to a collector who wants an authentic Audubon at a, a more reasonable price range. Now we're going to look at two hand-colored lithographs by Edward Lear that were made in the 1830s. Edward Lear was a very talented young man, both as a literary uh, artist as well as a visual artist. More people know of him today as a writer, and he uh, authored such uh, the Book of Limericks and famous pieces such as The Owl and the Pussycat, although in his own lifetime, he was better known as a bird artist. And in part, the reason for that is that today, the printed word is more easily, widely disseminated than works of art. But in his day, actually, the writings that he made were private publications. When he was a very young man in his late teens, he enjoyed the patronage of the influential and powerful Earl of Derby. And it was a while at his estate, Knowsley Hall, that Lear authored the Book of Limericks and The Owl and the Pussycat as a private publication for the Earl's children. The Earl of Derby also had a extensive menagerie of natural history. And it was there that Lear was introduced to the birds and the animals in his collection and began to author uh, drawings of these. And Lear was employed uh, by John Gould when Gould was creating one of his earliest projects, The Birds of Europe. And today we have two examples of Lear's work from Gould's Birds of Europe. Now here we have the common heron and the barn owl. Lear was often compared to Audubon in his ability and his talent in his day, and many today consider him to be an artist of equal caliber. One of the aspects that make Lear's work distinctive is that he often worked from living subjects, which is very, very unusual. And I think that in part, that comes across in, in the finished drawing. Uh, Lear also did his own drawing on the lithographic stone. So didn't he not only authored the painting that was the model for what was to become the print, but he also drew the image on the stone. And you will see that in Lear's works, he usually signed them on the stone. So this is through and through an original work by Edward Lear. He, it's, it's difficult to describe, but in his draftsmanship ability, he achieved the, a lifelike and volumetric quality with a minimal of drawing. And this is in part because his draftsmanship was so excellent and accurate that with a single line or edge, it, it defined not only the edge of the subject, but the suggested the entire shape of it. This is especially noticeable when you get to areas that are very subtly colored with almost no color, almost a white on white effect 
Yet as you look at this print, you can see volume and the soft, uh, uh, in the neck of the bird and the softness of the feathers that are all suggested in a manner that is almost undetectable. Some of those same qualities are very apparent in the barn owl. Again, we have this white on white quality of the breast of the bird and, and his eyes and face. And also, you can see the signature here of Lear in the lithographic stone. So again, these are hand-colored lithographs. They were printed in one color, black ink, on the lithographic stone, and then hand-colored in the studio as the prints were being produced. Thank you for joining us again in our continuing series highlighting collections of important natural history art from our collection. See you next time. Don't forget to press the like button and subscribe to our channel. Thanks.